Hello and welcome to the Oxygen Addict Triathlon Podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, PrecisionHydration.com. Precision Hydration offer electrolyte drinks in different strengths to match how you sweat. Personalize your hydration strategy today at precisionhydration.com and you can get a special 20% off during August using the code OXYGEN20. We're also brought to you by new sponsors, Food Cell. The next generation of nutritional carriers designed to allow endurance triathletes and cyclists to carry enough food and gels while allowing easy access. You can get 20% off with the code OXYGEN20. That code is valid until the 9th of September 2018. Ideal for Ironman Wales. Check it out at flowcell.co.uk. And we're also brought to you courtesy of our patrons who support the show with a monthly donation. You can get our 2018 patrons-only podcast as a thank you. All right, and welcome to the show. We're back in the studio. We're kicking it. We've got a fantastic interview later on, haven't we, coming up with Neil Eddy, who was the fastest age grouper overall at Ironman UK recently. So some great tips and insights from him. We've got some results. We've got Coach's Couch. We've got bits and bobs of news as well. And uh, yeah, I'm excited. Hells, how are you doing? Rob, I'm very, very well, thank you. I got my 50 metre pool fix at the weekend. Oh, I haven't been in one hear. for a while. Yeah, decided Stockport might be the way forwards. It was great. Had it is lane. really good, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. 8 to 9.30 on a Saturday. I'm not, I shouldn't say this to too many people because suddenly I'll rock up next time and it'll be <laughs> busy. Be yeah, but seriously, two people in just Rich and I in the lane and a spare lane next to us. I was like, oh, this is where to come. Yeah, Stockport's got a great history of producing a lot Lots of the original. Of yeah, a lot of the original Olympians came through that pool, didn't they? Yeah. Did you watch, Rob, at the European Championships, they had the 25 kilometre open swim. No, I'm not tempted. However, <laughs> in the women's race, the Italian won by 0.1 of a second. Yeah, my, dad, my dad excitedly came steaming in and said, it's been a dead heat. It's amazing. <laughs> Five hours and 20 minutes of swimming and they're separated by 0.1 of a second. What the actual heck? That is, that is <laughs> a long way to swim, isn't it, as well? That's a long, yeah. long time to be in the water for. Yeah, I'm like I say, no, I'm not tempted. No, no. Not this year anyway. Not next year either. What have you been up to, Rob? Um, I have been, I'm in the middle of school holidays with my little dude. So I've been running around mostly playing frisbee this week. We've right. mastering the art of seven-year-old frisbee throwing. Uh, a bit of heading with the new football. So uh, yeah, lots of fun doing that. And generally trying to sneak onto the turbo trainer in the middle of the night to get a little bit of training done whenever I get the chance. But it's nice, isn't it? It's nice to have a bit of downtime and have a bit of holiday time with the dude, really. Yeah, a bit of daddy time. What's the yeah. latest slash earliest you've been on the turbo? Oh, 5 a.m. Oh, yeah. Only when it needed doing. You're doing a Ruth Purbrook. Yeah, <laughs> a bit of inspiration <laughs> there. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, well, it's not very nice. All right, should we jump into a bit of results? Yes, I think we should. Let's do that. Should we start off in Glasgow that we've just mentioned? Yeah, let's let's do it. The old um, European Championships have been going on, and uh, wow, some some good racing, but perhaps not quite the results we hoped for on the men's side. It was I was excited seeing Ali Brownlee racing over this distance again, and it just didn't quite happen for him, did it? No, and I think he has been struggling with injury uh, for the past couple of weeks, and he just hasn't been able to put that run training together. He's obviously been training massively as well for the 70.3 world championships that's right yeah. and so he was completely well, he said he admitted he was you know pretty tired coming into it um and it went instead to Pierre of uh, France but yeah Brownlee was right up there wasn't he on the on the bike and at the start of the run but then faded and and finished in fourth yeah just like that little bit of sharpness in the run unfortunately however a bit of good news over on the ladies side with it's got to be said st- donkingly powerful performance from Jess Learmonth, wasn't it? Just incredible. Oh, yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. And um, yeah, it was great to see Jess Learmonth again up there um, getting getting the medals. Um, so she got silver. Nicholas Spirig, Rob, it was his sixth European title. Yeah, do you know, I, ju- I thought then after I said that, that's really wrong of me to talk about Jess first, just because we're in Britain. I think Nicholas Spirig is... <laughs> 
is an incredible standout performance as well, isn't she? Coming back from just having a, she's just had a second child. Is that right? Mum of two now, yeah. And obviously, in you know, let's go back to London 2012 when she just won in that. Yeah. I want to say dead heat on the line, but obviously she won it. But you know what I mean? It was a photo yeah. finish against Lisa Norden. Um, so since then, she has had two children. She's done the marathon, hasn't she, at the European Athletics Championships a couple of years ago. She's done an Ironman. She, she got silver just... at 2016 as well. Correct, behind Gwen Jorgensen. Yeah. And she's just a phenomenal, phenomenal athlete. And I really love the fact, Rob, that she was back doing the mixed relay as well. And it was, she, she started her leg. Like, I didn't see this. What happened? Oh, she started her leg maybe, was it 17 seconds down? By the end of the by the end of it, she was 11 <laughs> seconds up on the rest of them. It was incredible. You're not betting against her, are you, in a relay leg? Oh, no, you're really, really not. I mean, France went on to to get that win with uh, Switzerland getting second. And it was, yeah, it was just incredible to watch. And you sort of think she's probably old enough to be one or two of the, you know, mum to one or two of them. Yeah, and absolutely. At 36, having... she probably is, yeah. isn't she, when you think? Yeah, just imagine having her on your team, though. You'd automatically, yeah. you you wouldn't want to let her down, would you? No, not at all. So yeah, great win for Nicholas Berg in the women's race with Jess Learmont in second, and then Beaugrand of France third. All right, next up, let's have a little chat about the racing over in Finland at Challenge Turku. Um, I saw a little tweet out there. Congrats to Team Precision Hydration Pro Triathlete Sarah Lewis on her win. So she's had a cracking race out there. Um, I think on the men's side, Sebi Keenley took it out after coming out of the water a little bit down and then just, did you see this, destroyed the field on the bike. He said oh, in yeah. an interview that I read that he was he was a bit angry that it took him a while to get his engine going and he he put out a 155 bike leg which is the fastest he's ever recorded and it's i mean it's legit because no one else went under 202 so seven minutes clear of a field he's that's a stonking performance for him isn't it that is sticking the hammer down yeah and then he did a 112 run off the bike so yeah hanging about and in cracking shape isn't he yeah, absolutely. Um, Do you know, is Tom, he racing, is he going to race the 70.3 world champs? Put me on the spot there, Rob, not sure. I wonder whether he is, because with that kind of form, you'd think he'd throw his hat in the ring just for just for racing on race day's sake, wouldn't you? Yeah, it, it's an interesting one this year with it being in South Africa, isn't it? And, and some pros are going to be skipping it because just with travel and Kona, it just doesn't sort of fit in, but... Obviously, some will be targeting it, but I think it's with him though, he's because he's in Europe already, isn't he? It's a bit of a flight, but at least there's no time difference. You just zip straight down, and and pretty much you're there. So, I think a lot of American pros won't want to come over for it with that big time gap. But maybe who knows? Might, might play into his hands. Yeah. Don't know. TBC. We shall see. Yes, TBC. TBC. Other results that we saw there. Um. Over in the US, we had the Steelhead 70.3 uh, men's results. We had Eric Lagerstrom basically ran down Andy Starkowitz. Again, there's another super performance by him there, doing a 158 on the bike. Uh, but Eric Lagerstrom came through on the run with a 118 and just snuck it by a couple of minutes there. Um, over on the ladies' side, we had a win for Sarah Haskins. That's right. She won in 4.16, just ahead of Jackie Herring and then Christine Cross. So USA 1-2-3. Cracking stuff. So we've got to give a shout out there to our sponsors, Precision Hydration. You've heard mentioned there already that they sponsor Sarah Lewis. So cracking to see one of their sponsored athletes doing well. Um, you've heard us talk about these guys a lot on the show if you're a regular listener. But if you're not, these are the people to see to sort out your electrolyte needs for race day. You can personalize your own hydration strategy by visiting precisionhydration.com and take that online sweat test if you haven't done already. If it turns out that suggests that you're a particularly salty or particularly heavy sweater, you can actually go and visit them in person and have the physical sweat test done and find out exactly how sweaty you are. And regular listeners will have heard my story about finding out I'm an incredibly salty 
sweater, which has resulted in me being very ill indeed after several races. And ever since switching over to using precision hydration, I've had no problems at all at the end of races with feeling sick and passing out and ending up on drips and all kinds of stuff, which used to be my previous post-race experience so just a reminder you can get a special 20 percent off during august using the code oxygen 20 and rob dan anderson uh, got in touch and he said after originally hearing about precision hydration on on our podcast he said i've just ordered my second batch it helped rescue me on the long rides in the heat recently and hopefully it'll be pulling me through kona in nine weeks time hashtag road to kona so That's yeah good luck dan that's, I hope that means hopefully they're going to help him through rather than he's hoping to still qualify at this point. I'm sure it means he's already qualified. And I think so, yeah. <laughs> they'll do the business for you, mate. Don't you worry. That's the stuff that you need in your water bottle and in your belly on race day in Kona, and no mistake. It's all good. Right, we'll jump into Coach's Couch. And we've got an interesting one this week, Hells, that's been thrown up in the old Facebook group from Team Oxygen Addict. Do you want to read out the question and we'll have a little chat about this? Yeah, I like this one. So if your Ironman is possibly going to be non-wetsuit, what difference will it make to the swim? Yeah, so this has happened to a lot of people this year and all over Europe. We've had this heat wave going on and people have been worried that, you know, at the last minute you're going to find out that the race is going to be non-wetsuit. Um, one of my guys, Rob, is racing over in, oh, which one? It's Sweden this weekend, isn't it? It's, and Copenhagen, both of them are going on. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So he's racing in Sweden and he was really worried that they're being told that the water's, you know, right on the point one of a degree centigrade at the moment between is it going to be non wetsuit or not. So he's really concerned because obviously he's a performance focused athlete and he's shooting for a time. And, and he was interested in, you know, what difference is it going to make if I swim with my wet with my wetsuit on or if it's a non wetsuit swim and if it is non wetsuit what do I wear do I wear a tri suit or a sleeve tri suit or just swimming trunks and and we racked the brains of everybody in the group and what we discovered was although there's a lot of sort of anecdotal evidence nobody really had ever done any testing of this and this athlete Rob is a very scientific minded guy so he's gone down and done the testing for us and I thought it'd be really great to get this on the show for other people who are in a similar situation right yeah, right. So should we give out a little bit of, uh, give the results out, Rob? Yeah, and we shall indeed. So what he basically did was went to his open water location and he swam 400 metres repeatedly in the different setups to see what different it would make. And he's recorded the number of arm strokes it took, his time to do it, and his average heart rate for the swims as well, which, you know, it's... Yes, it's only a sample size of one, and yes, it's only one swim, but I think it gives a it gives a general feel for how the number's going to go, doesn't it? Yeah, and this was 400 metres, wasn't it? And it was, um, I just, it was 400 metres, and it was sort of Ironman race pace, wasn't it? That's right, yes. Yeah. So he's not going flat out. He's swimming at the kind of perceived effort and heart rate that he's confident he can he can do on race day. And, and obviously, being an experienced athlete, he's got quite a good feel for this. So here we go, drum roll. Results are in. So the first up he did, the wetsuit swim. What did he do that in the time for the wetsuit swim, Hells? Yeah, so he did 6.11. Uh, he had 184 arm strokes and a heart rate of 132. Okay, next up, sleeveless tri-suit. So 7.20, 220 arm strokes, heart rate of 134. Okay, so basically same heart rate, lots more arm strokes. Short-sleeved tri-suit, like a speed suit. 7.22. 226 arm strokes, heart rate 131. So basically identical to the sleeveless tri suit there, that result, isn't it? And then finally tested in swim trunks. That was the one that surprised me. The old jammers, 737, 231 arm strokes, and his heart rate was 126. Yeah, so it looks like he's looks like he's going a little bit easier maybe around that swim, but you know, give or take, it's interesting. I, I had assumed swim trunks would have been faster than either the sleeveless tri suit or the short sleeved tri suit, but not in this case, obviously, for this swimmer. So a couple of interesting thinking points come out of this. The first thing is, obviously, for him, he's going to be a lot slower come race day. That minutes difference per 400 is going to translate to probably 10 minutes different on race day to how he could go if he gets a wetsuit swim. So he's sitting there with his fingers crossed. I think that's probably going to be the same for most athletes. Now, the caveat here is when we said this in the group, a couple of people said, actually, that's not the case for me. I'm much slower with a wetsuit on. 
And these are athletes who are actually pretty good swimmers already. So what they found is putting a wetsuit on messes with their body alignment. It messes with their feel for the water and actually makes them a bit slower. Which really? is surpri- Yeah, it's surprising, isn't it? Both of them are decent swimmers. So again, things we suggested to them were, well, maybe you need to go out and try different wetsuits. And, and unfortunately for them, it's going to involve going to the top end of the wetsuit manufacturer because it seems that most wetsuit manufacturers when they make a suit for swimmers that's kind of quite thin all over, it tends to be more expensive. So, you know, bizarrely, the top end suit isn't always the best one for just your average swimmer, just because of the way they're made in terms of neoprene thickness. A lot of these suits have got very thick legs to help raise your legs if you're not a great swimmer. But obviously that messes with you if you're a decent swimmer and you've got a good feel for the water. So, so yeah, so basically if, you're, if your race does get turned into a non-wetsuit swim, and you've never done any swimming in open water without a wetsuit on, you've got to expect it to feel different. So if you're a performance-focused athlete and you're worried about this kind of stuff affecting you, it is worth going down to your local lake and doing these different swims and just see for your sake of mind, firstly, what the time difference is going to be roughly. But secondly, just get used to having some swims in open water without a wetsuit on because you know you don't want to be turning up and having to do this for the first time on race day, do you? No, not at all. And it, it, it is, I remember ahead of Paguera, I was really worried that it would suddenly be turned into not wet, not non-wetsuit. But a couple of things that you do have to remember, everyone else is going to be in the same boat. Exactly. You always have to yeah. remember that. So it's not going to be suddenly that you're the only one being 10 minutes slower than the normal. You know, everybody's swim times pretty much will be slower if they're not in a wetsuit. And yeah, at the moment, Rob, it, it's it's gone uh, quite a bit colder here again in in the UK, and so the thought of going in non wetsuit is a little bit chilly. But you know, you don't have to do it, overdo it, do you? But maybe if you are expecting a non wetsuit swim, just be prepared to if you get the chance. Yeah, and as you said, if you're going to do it for the first time, swim in open water on a hot day when you're in direct sunlight because that makes so much difference. It can be the difference between feeling Baltic in the water and feeling really comfortable just because your body's already warm and the, you know, the ambient temperature is warm. As you said, you do it today. It's probably 15 degrees outside at the It'd moment. I don't recommend it. <laughs> it would be it would be refreshing. Let's say that else. <laughs> it would honestly. I just so before Paguera, I did do that and I vowed I would never, ever swim in Salford Keys without a wetsuit again because it was so cold and um yeah really didn't recommend it but obviously as i mentioned what six weeks ago two months ago now i was back in there without a wetsuit and it was amazing it's been brilliant this year because it's been so hot hasn't it so again yeah. that ambient temperature and direct sunlight makes all the difference so listen i hope that helps some people out who are approaching races and possibly looking at maybe having to do non-wetsuit swims bit of interesting information there for you um if you are interested in the kind of stuff that goes on inside our private Facebook group, Team Oxygen Addict is currently open for memberships. It'd be interesting to see if we can get more members in this year because we want to grow the team. And we've had lots of great comments at races and stuff about how many of the tri suits people have seen out there. So we'd love to have more people on board. If you've got any questions, feel free to fire them over to help at oxygenaddict.com. And we've got a whole range of coaching options there from team coach training plans all the way through to bespoke one-to-one training and coaching by me and other uh, other coaches as well. So get in touch if you want to know more. Okay, next up, Hells, we are going to have our interview of the week. And before we do that, we get to talk about our latest sponsor, don't we? We do, Rob. It's We have a new sponsor on board. It's Food Cell. It is the aero way to carry your nutrition. It's awesome. Right, so basically, I'm really excited to have these guys on board um a chap called mark talon contacted me he himself is a i'm sure people know his name is a very good um age group level triathlete and unfortunately i'm going to say at this point as well get well soon mark he was meant to be racing iron man um either calmar, sweden or it? yeah it's calmar this weekend yep. really gunning for the kona slot came off his bike on loose gravel last weekend and broke his collarbone and his last ride before the race so he's currently sitting at home all strapped up and probably feeling a bit sorry for himself so get well soon mark but anyway mark has designed this product from the ground up in response to the fact that he couldn't find a top tube food carrier that could fit in enough gels or flapjacks or whatever you want on your top tube during race day and access easily 
he sent me one and he sent Hell's one and we've both trialed them. I used this when I raced. I used um, basically a, a pre-production prototype when I raced at Lakesman. And this thing is bloody brilliant, I've got to say. It's much bigger in terms of the actual area of storage inside the box than any of those other ones I've come across. And the great thing about it is it isn't actually physically bigger in real life. It doesn't stick out. It's really aerodynamic. It's been aero tested in the tunnel with those fluid dynamic computer things to actually reduce drag. So you've got no worries about this causing you an aero penalty. The best bit, Hells, is that slidey thing on top of it here. Yeah. Slide about. And we've got here, listen to this. One finger and closed again. <laughs> so it's got this slidey thing that's completely waterproof. So even if you've got bits of flapjack inside it, they're not going to get wet as you're riding. Nice, big, fat, wide opening to get your clumsy fingers in, if you're like me. And it can fit four gels inside, four of those big, fat, watery 65-gram gels in. So yeah. it's awesome. You've been using one as well in your rides this week, haven't you? Yeah, I put mine uh, on my bike to to go to work and just see sort of what it was like. And it was really easy to access and to open, you know, while you're, while you're, while you're pedaling away, basically. basically. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, you know previously i would have always used one of the sort of a, a little top tube i don't know like 10 15 pound little bag thing with the velcro and you'd have to undo it wouldn't you with the velcro and flip it over and then it wouldn't shut properly and whereas this is just a no with this it's literally a finger slide it open and you can slide it back again and you were saying rob that you have been using a previously a very aero um carrier yeah, but you couldn't actually a, get anything out of it. A different brand that's small and looked really sleek in the photographs. And when I actually got the thing on my bike, you literally, I'm not saying figuratively, you literally can't get more than one gel into the damn thing. And it's almost impossible to get anything out of as you're riding along because you've got to use your fingers to try and squeeze the damn thing out of it. So I was really disappointed with that brand I had on the bike, despite it looking pretty. This one is a bit taller. It's got a nice square cam tail at the back so you can get those extra gels in there. And riding at the Lakesman, I was like, OK, <laughs> you laughed, didn't you? Because it was like it arrived the day before Lakesman. And you've said to me, never use anything new on race day. Right, coach? And I was like, I'm going for it. This It feels great. And it was. It was one finger to slide it open. Out came the gel. There's even room to stick the gel wrapper back in it afterwards as well and slide it shut. And it was in and done. And I thought, these guys have got it cracked. It's you can affix it to the top tube with two bolts if you've got a bike like mine that's got those two bolts on the top tube or they've got those natty little um velcro, velcro. straps yeah that hide away really neatly as well so really well engineered product i'm going to stop going on about it now you can go over and check it out their website is flowcell.co.uk although the, the product is called food cell and just up until the 9th of september listeners can get 20 percent off with the code oxygen 20 so it's basically valid until um i am man wales know, race day so if you're racing this year and you need a solution to either carry nutrition i think you could even get spares in this hells i've had my spare yeah. tube and a um co2 and little tool thingy in it as well so it'd be a solution for that for people if you're looking for that for your race day get on it quickly and take advantage of the 20 percent off that'd be a nice fat saving and uh Great company, great people, run by triathletes. Really know Mark really knows his stuff. He's designed a great product from the ground up, and uh, I think it's going to make a lot of people very happy. Yep, flowcell.co.uk for your food cell. So, Rob, let's hear now from Neil Eddy, who, as we mentioned earlier, he's a very talented age grouper. He's a blooming fast runner as you'll hear shortly because sure he did a, a very swift time at a standalone uh, london marathon and um yeah he was sixth over the line at ironman uk so here we go here is this week's interview of the week neil eddie hello and welcome to the oxygen addict triathlon podcast how are you i'm very good thank you thanks for having me on the show absolute pleasure you're on your holly bobs i feel i've disrupted something <laughs> Not at all. Um, yeah, a few days away. I was away for a training camp, which ended up sort of being rest and recovery and uh, and a bit of a holiday. So, oh, yeah, perfect. it's all good. Neil did uh, remarkably fine at um, Ironman UK in Bolton. Six overall, wasn't it, Neil? Yeah, six overall, yeah. That is awesome. So, uh, do you feel fully recovered from it? Um, yeah, I think I do. I think if I, maybe if I tried to... Uh, 
few put a few intense sessions in or something i might i might feel it more then but um definitely feel a bit more recovered now and and a bit bit refreshed it's um it's hard to tell sometimes because you feel like like anyone else you, you talk to your coach and you think you know just take it easy let me know how you feel and you, you're like oh i do feel all right but then as soon as you try and do something then you're like oh actually yeah i need to uh need to take it easy was bolton always on the plan for this year uh, not at all not at all that, that's why this holiday was preempting was going to be a bit of a training camp which uh, like i said is, is a recovery i actually raced Ironman lanzarote six weeks before bolton with the plan to qualify for kona which i narrowly missed out on uh, in my age group so i wasn't too disappointed because my result was still very good there i just didn't have a very good day on the bike um but then ran exceptionally well so i was pleased with the result but at the same time a little a little bit disappointed even though i finished 24th overall i didn't manage to get a slot to kona so then i thought well i need to try and give it another go so i'll try and enter something else and then had a conversation with my coach and thought do we enter bolton do i enter something else and then i knew a few people from home that were the race in that way so i decided to i enter bolton probably about three or four weeks before maybe but then the plan was kind of like a little bit of recovery after lanzarote but i ended up sort of doing the otillo on the ozzacilli um which for those people that don't know is kind of running and swimming multi-terrain that's across. a long beast of a way that is a long way that isn't it <clears throat> It, it was and probably doing it a couple of weeks after Lanzarote wasn't, wasn't a great idea but um, I was kind of standing in for a friend that got an injury um, and they asked if I wanted to do it and then I was racing with someone that um, isn't as fast as me um, so it was kind of like I thought well we're doing it together I can go his pace and and, and take it a bit bit easier but we actually we had a fantastic day and it was um, it was amazing to see and Although I live in Cornwall and live on the coast and live only a few miles from there, I think I've only ever been to the Aussie City once. So to get to go out there and, and do the race was uh, a great little opportunity and it was great fun. Had you done, um, a, swim, to... had you done a, um, a swim run before? Um, no, only aquathons and, and different things, but uh, nothing of, of, of that scale. So it was a bit of the unknown. So it was kind of a bit, um, <clears throat> how, how do we do this? Uh, and just luckily my partner... Um, he had already sort of thought out the plan of what they were going to do and whether they bungee or whether you use hand paddles or pool boys and things like that and, and uh, just got me I just sort of caught up on things of how he was going to do it and we and we went from there really How did it compare to uh, an Ironman and a triathlon? It was very different I must admit and my friend's a very good swimmer um, as well so we I was thinking well we take it in turns a bit and he was like no, you go in front and I'll just get a little bit by you and uh and we're tether and and we're hand paddles but having not i normally swim with hand paddles quite a bit but doing it over the, that distance in open water was uh was a new experience after the first few swims i was like oh my god i can now feel that and i, I kind of wish i didn't have hand paddles on at the time <laughs> for a little bit but it's definitely beneficial it's definitely beneficial just needed to i didn't obviously train for it so um the idea was just to give it a go and then in a couple of years go back with with a friend and then try and do try and do well at the event and try and get a quick time i love that i don't think many people who would have been on the start line at bolton would have done a full otillo race ahead of it so uh good on you there neil i, I love that <laughs> Sometimes it's good to, you know, mix up the prep a little bit. So we're going to come on to Bolton in a little bit. But first of all, let's go back because you've been in triathlon for, you've been in the sport for quite a few years, haven't you? Yeah, um, it's really hard to say when you start start a sport like this. But yeah, def- definitely been uh, in it a few years and, and Ironman for the last couple of years, really. Um, and it kind of just seems to evolve this sport as, as you kind of do one thing and it starts off as a hobby and then a few years later you start thinking, oh, maybe I should do a bit of training and I might might do all right at this. And, uh, and then it sort of evolves from there, really. I think I did my first triathlon in Cornwall probably like 2004, five. Perrin triathlon was my first one, which is quite a tough sea swim and, and sort of, I think, well-renowned race. And I decided to do that as my first one without really training much. And me and my friend back then, you know, um, and I don't think the sort of, information was out there as much of how to train for triathlon so we were kind of swimmers and played a lot of sport and and we started like uh to race triathlons and you know i might i might run like once a month or something like that <laughs> just get by and then do a race and struggle we used to think like long bike rides were 
going out for 40 minutes or <laughs> spinning around the block basically and were you into surf lifesaving as well being from cornwall no i wasn't actually it's probably one of the few sports i didn't do and uh my family and my parents always used to say to people like um you know there's not many sports we can name that neil doesn't do um so i, I would just play, basically play any sport any night of the week and at school and for all the different teams and it was kind of like I always played well at a lot of sport. I didn't necessarily excel in one individual sport, so I kind of used to just carry on playing everything and, and played to a good standard in a couple of sports. Um, that probably gave me my, my background in some knowledge of sport in, in triathlon, really. So when did you first start taking it quite seriously? Because you were age group world champion in 2014. So was there a couple of years leading up to that? Yeah, maybe like uh, sort of four or five years before all that kind of probably when I sort of finished university and, and ha- had less time on my hands what a waste of what waste of time like university I had all that time to train and didn't actually do much now you have a full-time job you try and squeeze as much in as you can that's so true but, um, <laughs> but uh, it kind of wasn't as important back then I played a lot of water to a high level at university so then when I finished um, and then thought you know you need to train maybe through the winter um, and then I sort of started racing a few of the elite super series um races and entering local races and then age group world championships and uh, uh and kept kept narrowly missing out and on a few things in some world championship races and kept finishing fourth and things and uh so it kept giving me that drive to sort of give it another go and i, I, I lost a couple of uh, world championship sort of medals by a couple of seconds through through one reason or another that were just sort of freak incidents that i couldn't control and it's like oh so i I went back and, uh, yeah, in 2014, sort of won the age groups in Edmonton. And then that's how I then got into conversation with my with my current coach, Joel Jameson. And uh, at the time I was saying, I'm thinking about sort of stepping up to half Ironmans. And, and he was thinking it was a good move. And we sort of had a conversation and then we started working together. And um, sort of everything evolved from there, really. 70.3 uh, Barcelona in 2016. That was a good, that yeah, was a good race. Yeah, so I there, had done it? a couple of races. But it was a very good race, yeah. And I entered that with the intention to qualify for the 70.3 Worlds. Um, and I've done some other half Ironman distance races, obviously the year before that in 2015, and kind of just got into the understanding of how those races work and then entered Barcelona to try and qualify for the for the Australian um, World Champs with the idea of trying to spend the summer out there with a... Uh, with a friend of mine who was also a uh, teacher and that was the idea to get out there so yeah it went really well and uh, everything everything evolved really and then Ironman Barcelona as well that year that then you got your qualification for Kona yeah sometimes I seem to like to do first time events and uh, do quite well at them and I think sometimes then I find it hard to then beat my uh, <laughs> my times from 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 races that I do first time so um, I kind of finished um racing in Malulaba in in the September and again a few friends from home uh, and a few older chaps in their 50s and stuff were, were entered into Ironman Barcelona and then I thought oh do you know what it's only five weeks away or four weeks away um maybe I could enter that race and just give it a go and then next year train for an Ironman like properly with my full attention on Ironman so <laughs> I'd kind of done enough training in Australia so it wasn't like I wasn't training. So we were training a lot in Australia, but maybe not specifically for, for the long distance races. So I spoke to my coach and he said, well, yeah, if you come home um, that weekend, then you'd have to do, you know, a hundred mile bike ride on the Saturday with a little runoff. And then on the Sunday, we'll have to do a 20 mile run to get you ready for in a couple of weeks time, just to make sure that, you know, you're, you're ready for it. So then I was like, oh, okay. So I got through that and that kind of, I think gave me the confidence that, oh yeah, I can still make that distance and, and do a rice in it. And then we got out to Barcelona, um, and I did have half an eye on on the Kona slot, but knew that that might be a, a, a very challenging position to try and put myself in. Um, and uh, yeah, everything everything went to plan and, and swam well, um, biked well, and, and and got into to a good sort of um, position on the bike, and then just set off on the run and. and very naively set off too quickly as most people do in their first time and and I think I had some friends at home that were sort of commenting or sending a message to my coach he's supposed to be running that pace 
No, he's running sort of 20, 30 se- 20 seconds or more faster a kilometre than he's supposed to. So <laughs> it very much hurt after the f- after the first 10 miles and then it got really hot. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it was, it was really challenging. And my friends were out there racing as well. So I, And I passed one of them um, on the run and he was like, oh, hello, Neil. He said, you're on your second lap of the run because it's a three-lap run. And I was like, and I sort of uttered under my breath, um, no third because <laughs> he was just starting the run and I was like oh, I don't really want to tell you that I'm actually only got another five don't or six K to run yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah it went really well and uh, you know I completed my first first Ironman in, in Barcelona and I think it was eight hours 46 minutes or so, or, or so give or take and what did you run what was your run split there I think it was a three three oh seven wow. it was the first time I've run any, anything over sort of 20 miles in, um, in any kind yeah, of so, in, first time in your life that you've done over 20 miles yeah yeah first time save it for an Ironman well that's it yeah yeah I, I always said that I was never going to do a straight marathon I'll just do a uh, just do my uh, first ever marathon in, in an Ironman so it's got a reason to do it <laughs> I love it have you always been a good runner don't be modest I, I, I think well I was a good runner when I was a young age so you know, when I started secondary school or just before that and uh, competed quite well. And then I kind of went away from it and I didn't really like individual sports. And I used to probably at a young age, like struggle with the sort of pressure of, of being on your own and doing things individually. And I can remember doing like county championships. Um, and, you know, I was in, in, in good running shape, I guess, um, probably fitness from all the other sports I did because I didn't really do much run training. Um, and then I'd get to the end of the track and have a couple of laps to go and I'd be sort of, you know, upset and things. My mum would be on the side of the track and, and start, start shouting to me, like, you better finish. You know, don't start crying. There's nothing wrong with you. You carry on. So uh, then I would. But I'd, I'd sort of let nerves at a young age uh, get to me a little bit. So then I was like, well, I'm not doing any individual sports when I'm older. It's going to be all team sports. And I started playing a lot of team sports and rugby and water polo and hockey and, and different things. Um, but then it kind of did full circle and came back around to uh, taking up individual sports again. Do you ever get those same feelings? No, uh, no, not not really. No, I think uh, a few years back, I probably get a bit more nervous. But my kind of nerves now, I kind of just go within myself a little bit, like most people do. And apparently, my friends tell me that I'm not very good to talk to around around races, or I go a bit quiet. And so um, I kind of just, start, I think, because I start focusing on the race and start thinking about things that I'm not really conscious of that other people may be talking to me and asking me questions and and everything. And I kind of just go a bit quiet. But, but otherwise, I deal with, with nerve side of things quite well now. And I think I kind of just open my up, myself up to it more and, and maybe talk more around races. And then um, I don't feel so bad. And I think maybe because I've got a lot of experience doing other things and, and, and racing in a lot of different places now, um, that it, does, it just feels... Um, just feels like another race and I think sometimes you've got to take that forward so you just kind of even if you get to a big race and just think you, you can only do what, what what you can do anyway so race your own race and uh, yeah what influence has Joel Jameson had your coach on you in terms of the mental side of it as well that comes with the training and um, when coach and when me and Joel first first um, spoke you know it was something I was looking at I was having a coach but it was like, where do you go? Like, where do you start looking for a coach? And actually, Joel dropped me an email, and then we started a, a conversation from there. Um, oh, really? He but I think you. The, the, well, he had a couple of athletes that raced when I was out in Edmonton and, and just dropped me a message and sort of said, you know, um, saw your results and, and things. Maybe there's something we can do together. And uh, and I had that sort of conversation. Don't know if you already coached. If you are, you know, that's fine. Um, and actually, that actually you know I am looking for a coach and I'm thinking of stepping up in distance and before that I've only ever coached myself um, I've had some coaches and things but um, at our local clubs but otherwise I'd just set my own um, schedule you know and, and set my own training like like lots of people do so um, I think stepping up in the distance it was it was great to um, have that support and actually you get that confidence that you are doing things the right way you're not uh, there's no self-doubt there because you just got to trust I think what what um what your program set up to do and it's kind of in the end it's, it's the accountability i think with that training that you can just each week look on training peaks or 
um, anything else, and then just think, right, I've just got to tick those sessions off today, right, what am I going to do tomorrow, okay, and you just kind of tick those sessions off, and um, I've always always been one to never miss sessions, even even from a young age, as like swimming and things, you know, I'd never miss sessions, so um, even more so now that uh, no one ever likes to see a, uh, a red, red box, box in their training no. peaks. <laughs> Everyone hates it, don't they? So, <laughs> I remember once, sometimes when you get those little thoughts in your head, I remember once last summer sort of saying to him, I don't seem to have run as much this summer as I did last year. And he was like, yeah, but you also didn't run a 2.34 marathon at the start of the season at London. Uh, you know, so, <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, that's a good point. I, I forgot I have uh, I forgot I did all that run training at the start of the season for, for, <laughs> for London Marathon. And But yeah, so... Um, you take a lot of confidence from, like, say, those big sessions that you do um, at the weekends, and when you have these big training weeks, you know, like, I think you remember that then moving towards towards the big races. It's amazing how coaches magically can see the bigger picture, yet we get tied up in the you know the day to day, don't we? What difference specifically has Joel or coaching made to your training? So, what does your training look like? more structured sessions I think back in the day when I first started doing stuff um, you could very much just tick over you know like, like people do grey zone training you sort of do one thing or another so those structured sessions are definitely key so going on to uh, Bolton you've obviously been to Kona before you were 19th um, at 2017 so you wanted to qualify for Kona at Lanzarote it didn't happen you went to Bolton and I guess you had the expectation then, right, I'm entering it because I want to qualify for Kona. Yeah, I did, yeah. We we sort of I had a quick conversation with, with Joel and um and also like sort of family and sort of thinking, Well, if I race uh, another Ironman mid season in August and try to qualify because I'd be fresher and I'd probably have a chance to get um race fit again and and I was, I was thinking, Well, but then Kona would be approaching and I wouldn't be very close to sort of being in good shape for that necessarily so the idea was maybe not to be in uh i might not be in my best shape in in bolton but um to give it a go and just try and get a qualifying slot and um you know if things start going a bit pear shaped on, on, on the run late on because i'm still a bit fatigued from the other races um you know just to just to get get through it but um in the end it, it sort of all worked out and, and came together nicely I love that. Just give it a go, and then you can go and absolutely <laughs> smash it. <laughs> yeah. Did you did you surpass your expectations? I didn't expect to finish so high overall. I think um, I'm a very competitive mindset. So I think you know, even in the biggest of races, I still go in, always go in with a mindset of uh, finishing on that podium, whatever whatever level I'm at. Even even if I wasn't of that level, I think I'd still have like half an eye on it. You know, when, kind of when I entered my first Ironman, and Joel was like you know we we're trying to get around nine hours or so and, and to go that much under and I was thinking well I, I did kind of think I could do that <laughs> and, uh, and I just thought I'd give it a go you know um and, and sometimes I just take that naivety into into races if I'm uh sort of bring that competitive mindset and something like I said not not a bit of naivety and then just give it everything and uh just kind of hope for the best as well you know and hope that everything comes together because so much can change during the race and so many issues can come about. It's just trying to sort of manage yourself here with that race. And I think I know my body quite well to to react to things or um, change things and learn from some lessons over the years of how to deal with with, with things. When you were out on the um, on that run course, did you pass some of the pros? Did you pass someone like you know like Fraser Cartmel? Um, I wasn't sure if I was already in front of him. I know he had. Uh, I had a really good swim. It was a bit unf- unfair on the on the pros, and I know people have talked about it on different different places and different forums and stuff. That you know the pros had uh, obviously a non wetsuit start, and they only had like a hundred meters or seventy five meters start on us. Um, and we were wetsuit, so in a two lap swim, that was always going to come come together. Um, and I, I jumped in the swim and started swimming, and then eventually I, I was with a, another chap. Um, and I was following him around and, and we must have overtook quite a few of the pros in the swim on the first lap and then there must we overtook a few in the second lap but it was hard to tell them because there's so many people in the water you kind of just kind of just dodging and, and weaving in between people all the way back and I remember getting back in the swim 
jumping in front of the guy that I was with who was sat on the feet, his feet for quite a bit of the uh, first lap. And I went in front of him and thought, you know, you can draft off me for a bit now. And started swimming and he came straight round me and straight in front. I went, oh, OK, then. <laughs> it doesn't bother me. I quite happily sit sit here at this pace because um, I'm not swimming any faster, even if I'm in front of you. But getting out the swim um, and around for the transition, um, I think they were shocked to see us running into transition. So as we came out, I know they were announcing some pro names. And I remember running out and, and someone shouted out one of the professional names. And then I looked thinking, well, no, they must be in front you know and then but they were obviously there was a couple behind coming out on the bike so as we went out on the bike i think i was probably the second person out onto the bike um at, at the time and um and then a couple of pros started coming past and will clark come past and then a bit later on sort of joe skipper and a few others so i ended up cycling um most of the most of the ride with a guy called simon and, and sort of we kind of just worked off each other and uh and, and got around Got around the course on the bike. And then, um, how did you feel so, yeah. going into the run? Um, I was, I guess, I was a little bit nervous getting into the run because I kind of thought, you know, I've never, never raced an I've only ever raced an Ironman at the end of the season. So last year, only I did Kona at the end of the season. I did the year before, I did Barcelona. So when people said like, at home, like, oh, how long does it take to recover from an Ironman? I'm like, well, it's different for everyone, but I don't actually know how long it takes for me to recover because I've only ever done one at the end of the season and then I kind of just have time off anyway, so I don't know how the body reacts. So going on to the run, I was a little bit little bit nervous and I thought, I, I knew I'd still been running well this year um, and I was in good run shape. Um, so I just set off onto the run and just um, just tried to, tried to get into a pace. And I remember thinking on the first lap and you run up the first steep hill through the park and I'm like, oh my god it's not going to happen today my legs are done you know and I feel I felt horrendous starting the run um after the first nice little sort of mile and or mile or two through the town um and then you get up through the park and then it's basically just a long drag for a couple of miles or mile and a bit or whatever it is so it's just nice we get to the far turnaround and you start coming back down and you kind of was enabled to sort of free the legs a bit and sort of get the pace back going and then then I felt okay, um, and I was, I was racing against the guy that I was with on the bike, and, um, you know, I went past him on the first lap of the run, second lap of the run, he comes past me, third lap, I go back past him, and then fourth lap, when obviously the legs are completely uh, going at that stage, he came past, and I thought, that's it now, I'm not, I'm not going past you again. Um, but yeah, so it's kind of it's kind of the unknown when you get onto a run, isn't it? Um, and you just got to trust that the pace that you're, you're going at is, is what you can sustain, and you're always going to slow it. You know, you're always going to be slowing down towards the end, um, but you're just hoping that other people slow down more. So, I was quite shocked when I came in, you know, towards sixth place because I didn't actually sort of know what position what position I was in at the time. Um, and I was coming around, and I must have overtook the uh, uh, the leading age grouper at the time on on the run. And uh, I had my girlfriend and, and her family on the course, and they were like, "Well, you didn't sort of shout out asking for positions like you did in your last race, so we didn't want to tell you because we knew you were catching him." But we just didn't want to tell you that he was still a couple of minutes in front at the time of the run. But eventually, you sort of just got past him, and um, and you were back, sort of, you know, leading as as the first amateur. So, but yeah, it was a great feeling. And um, but the legs were completely, completely going towards the end, coming down. So I was more than happy to get to that finish line. Did you know at that point that you were the first age group? Because obviously they're, they're saying it on the mic as well. But did you have any any indication? Yeah, I kind of, I, I kind of thought I must have been. You know, I, I, I kind of uh, was assuming when I was on the run, even when I got off the bike, that as long as I ran well, I knew I'd sort of get the Kona slot. Um, and as long as it, as long as it didn't fall apart, that I had a, that was in a good position to get a slot. So I kind of just had to sort of keep trundling along and, and hoping. But um, as you're passing people, and it's really hard to tell because sometimes you might pass someone, um, but you're not sure if they're on the first lap, the second lap. Um, so it's really, really sort of hard to tell where, you, where you're at. So coming down to the finish and, and getting announced the first age group and, and finishing um, sixth favourite all in, in, well inside the top ten was, um, was was obviously fantastic to hear. It's, such, it's an absolutely fantastic result as well because you did a 2.57 marathon to finish it off. So no shabby running there at all. And obviously you said in London previously that you did a standalone 2.34 marathon. So I guess you're always going to have that like run 
confidence which is cracking hot yoga are you going to be doing more hot yoga that's my question neil well i did use that as a um as a lead into to kona last year and i thought i need to make some changes uh, you know last season but how do i how do i learn to deal with some heat and learn to sweat better and, and learn to deal with that so i did take up hot yoga where i live um for a while and I, I haven't actually been doing it much recently because i have a little bit of a hip niggle and uh and i've I had it all last year and I've got it this year uh, and a physio that I'd seen. Um, I've, I've, got, I've got a great physio and he referred me to a friend of his who's a specialist in hips and sort of said, well, maybe over exerting the hip is what's causing more sort of irritation um, and you haven't got anything fundamentally really damaging there. So maybe just try and stretch it less and do less on it. So I kind of stopped doing art yoga for a bit, but I might have to maybe go back in the summer, but just try and avoid any glute work and uh, not over and uh, not overexert it. And will will you be able to go into a heat chamber or anything instead um, as part of the heat preparations? Um, I don't think so, but um, hopefully a bit of trading away in the summer and uh, in a couple of weeks' time, again out to Portugal with friends. So hopefully a bit of heat training there, and then I'll probably just try and use the sauna. Um, a couple of times a week or something um, to try and acclimatise, and I've got the experience of it last year, and um, I actually, you know, I felt the full full wrath of Kona last year, and uh, f- completely uh, went into a deep dark hole on the run very early on last year. So um, I'm kind of hoping that doesn't happen again. <laughs> what point on the run? I learned from the experiences. Um, well, I kind of missed a uh, drink station at the end of the bike, which is obviously. A big no-no but um at the time you know you go to the the briefing you know they just sort of say they don't say like in other races and pinpoint on the map where the aid stations are they just sort of say you know they're every eight miles on the bike and pretty much every mile or so on the run you know give or take so i was like oh, okay you know i was coming back um off the bike and i dropped the drinks bottle and i was in a pace line with uh, a few chaps on the on the bike and i thought well I'm not going to go back for a bottle because if I leave the pace line, you know, I'm going to be cycling all the way back on my own. And I don't really fancy that. So I kind of carried on going and I couldn't get another drinks bottle because someone else was in the way and, and blocking. So I thought, that's OK, there'll be another drink station. Um, but then for the last sort of 15 miles or so on the bike, I can't remember how long it was now. I just didn't have a drink, um, which isn't a great idea going onto the run. So then not I started incredible. the run. <laughs> Definitely not. I started the run and um, I knew I was in, I was in, great shape and I thought and I know Kona is such a tough course but I knew you know me and Joel spoke and we knew we could run around the three hour mark and I thought if I can run around if I can swim solid bike solid and then run um around three hours then I'll be well within a shout of doing well overall and finishing on the podium and um I managed to get up to about second or first place on the running age group and I I was sort of running really well and I got to five miles and uh I was in a world of pain and uh, it was just a ton of bricks came down on me and I just I just I just had to start walking and I just never felt so horrendous in all my life and I had friends at home afterwards like sort of messaging like sort of you know like because they were following and they're all around my house watching uh, with my girlfriend and other people were sort of tracking it and watching the live coverage of, of the pros and uh, I was like no I'm, I'm not disappointed I'm like that is the most horrendous I've ever felt in all my life and a couple of miles later, I actually went past, you know, the turn into our <laughs> our um our apartment, our our home for the week, and uh, I was thinking I could have easily turned off then. If I was anywhere else in the world, there's no way I would have finished that race because I was just, you know, I walked for about seven eight minutes to start with, and it wasn't a fast walk. And um, I thought this is this is going to be a, a long day. And then in the end, you sort of have these conversations with yourself. You're thinking, well, even if I walk, you know, I've got another like however many hours to walk another 21 miles so then I started walking and uh, just got to the aid stations and just consumed everything I could and um, got to the next aid station and I basically just started walking in every aid station I got and my marathon time still wasn't that bad it seems I've walked every aid station and I walked for eight minutes so um, I know going back this year hopefully I'll have the confidence and uh, and a bit better insight into my nutrition to, to make sure that I'm in a better position on the run and uh, don't completely fall off the cliff face like I did last year. And the aim is to obviously finish on that podium. Yeah. So um, hopefully 
hopefully so hopefully if everything goes to plan and i'm in good shape going into the race then um i think as long as i can keep carrying my my decent run times and around like a 252 in lanzarote and an and then, like you said, a 2.57 in Bolton. So hopefully if I just not necessarily run that fast, but if I run near that in, in Kona, then I'll be within a shout, I think, of, of getting on the podium, hopefully. Neil, we will keep our fingers crossed. Thank you. <laughs> Robbie, such a modest guy. Isn't such he? a modest guy. Yeah. So understated. <laughs> but yeah, you get the feeling best... he, doesn't, he doesn't quite know quite how good he is, don't you, listening to him talk? It's just honestly, yeah, lovely. So modest and so calm. And it sounds like working with Joel Jameson's really helped him, you know, move on and and really kind of go up the distances as well. So best of luck for, for Kona. Jolly good. Nice one, Neil. Congratulations on that sixth place overall. Okay, just before we wrap it up this week, we've got a few bits and bobs of news to mention. So the first thing I've seen, Hell's is, I don't know whether you've seen this, there's a fitness star, in inverted commas, called Ashley Horner, who is attempting to complete 50 Ironmans in 50 days over in the US. Have you seen this? I did I did hear mention of this or see mention of this, and I, and I just thought they should get over to Switzerland and go and do the Decca. <laughs> yeah, actually go and do it. So <laughs> I was just going to say, I mean, check it out. She is apparently um, one of these kind of CrossFit stars who's moving over to Ironman. Um She's trying to do one every day and there's all kinds of fun games on the slow twitch forum that I thought people might find amusing because she's posting her live Strava data to show that she's you know, done all the distances and stuff every day. And I just think it's showing the worst part of human nature. People are going, you know, they're doubting whether she's done this. Why does a run start before a bike finishes? And you're thinking... Come on, she's attempting something absolutely incredible. Get behind the girl and, and give her a bit of, you know, give her a bit of encouragement rather than saying, "Oh well, it looks suspicious to me." It's possible that she's using different Garmin devices that are set to different times of day. I think, right? <laughs> oh, who so, knows? Oh. Best of luck to Ashley. I think it's a pretty amazing thing that she's trying to do. So, yeah, good luck to you, kiddo. Tim Dom Rob is our next little bit of news. He's going to be on the start start line uh ironman copenhagen this weekend because the final qualifiers will be sorted out for kona and he should should be safe with a seventh place finish interesting yeah, that'd be great really to see him back at kona this year wouldn't it oh yeah it would really really be good so yeah, yeah we will watch that one and then um, yeah, best of luck to tim amazing comeback Oh, totally. Go and head over to Torsten's try rating and all the stats and things are over there about who who can get it, who might miss out. Um, little shout out as well, Rob, to Laura Siddle, Purple Patch Pro athlete, friend of the show. She's got a very cool racing kit and you can actually buy it. Just pop Skody Laura Siddle replica range in Google and you'll see it. Um, the shop is open until the 24th of August and she's donating a percentage of sales to charity. All right, good stuff. Right, and one final thing before we go. Hells has been a very, very busy lady recently. She's been putting together um, one of her super duper podcast specials that's going to be out next week. And do you want to talk a little bit about it now, Hells, and then we'll play the trail for it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. So it's going to be a podcast special all about periods. It's called Blood, Sweat and Gears. And I've been doing Love quite it. a few different interviews. We, t- we did come up with a few suggestions, didn't we, for the for the name? But yeah, lots of different interviews with some very amazing women, I think, Rob, because it's not always easy to open up to a complete stranger about it is a very personal subject, but it's one yeah, and that... And it's something that most men don't really understand, the effect that it has on women who are who are competing and the way it affects them in the training and the way it affects their racing on race day when it happens at that time of the month. I was yeah. amazed listening to the interviews that you've sent through to me about this. So I know the temptation is for, you know, a certain element of the male population to go, oh, I'm not really interested in that, but... Honestly, if you're listening to this show, it's a brilliant listen. It's super, super interesting. And it goes way beyond just talking about periods. It goes into the effects of really heavy training on human bodies and the way that it can change 
the way that it can change people's health, doesn't it? Really health and how that's reflected in the monthly cycle in ladies. Yeah, absolutely. So here we go. Here is a little trailer, a little sneaky peek ahead of next week. Athletes prepare for everything, but they often don't prepare for their period. You know, it's the curse, as they call it, but it's a healthy curse. I had to go on some medication that's normally prescribed to your grandma or your nana to try and halt my bone density getting any worse. I just thought, you know, Jess, you're going to be in a wheelchair one day if you don't sort this out. I've had fellow pros reach out and be like, Mare, what do I do if I'm going to get my period? I'm scheduled to get it race day. And in my head, my first initial reaction is, you're screwed. <laughs> it hurts. It's horrendous. You're like, why is this happening on this one day of the month to me when it's race day? And I spent a lot of time sitting on the curb and crying in that race, which is not what you want to do in an Ironman. I was like in a sports bra too. I was like, well, that is what needs to be shown is the women bloat the seven to 10 pounds that we gain. Ugh, it was pretty horrible. All right, so tune in next week for the podcast special of Blood, Sweat and Gears. Some very interesting information coming your way and it's a great listen. There's some, there are some hardcore stories in that podcast, Hells. Yeah, definitely hardcore stories. Yeah, oh, people who honestly, are pushing the, themselves beyond limits you would think you can do. Totally. That um, the, the second voice that you heard is um, Jessica Piasecki or Jess Piasecki. And oh my goodness just her story alone will make any any coach any parent of a of a young um, female athlete really take note sure will all right so tune in again for that next week then listen guys thanks very much for listening just going to give a couple of shouts out again to our sponsors precisionhydration.com remember you can use the code oxygen20 during the month of august food cell you can use the code OXYGEN20 to get 20% off over at flowcell.co.uk. And thanks again to our patrons. Tune in next week for our podcast special of Blood, Sweat and Gears. And until then, listen, have a great, safe training and racing week. I'm Coach Rob Wilby. I'm Helen Murray. And if you're going to Ironman Copenhagen, I might see you there. Go over and say hi to Hells. And until then, we will talk to you again soon. Thanks, everybody. See ya. See ya.